Hello. Lovely to be here tonight. And um, this uh, sermon, this talk, I've titled Soft Hearts, Strong Bones Can't Lose. Is it, have we got any Dylan Panthers fans in the house? Anyone? Friday Night Lights? Yeah. No? <laughs> I really recommend it. That's why I've, I've called it Soft Hearts, Strong Bones Can't Lose. Okay, straight into the reading then. It's from 1 Peter, beginning at verse 13 of chapter 1. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now, you must be holy in everything you do, just as God, who chose you, is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favourites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now, in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. And just a couple of verses in 1 Peter chapter 2 from verse 11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbours. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, They will see your honourable behaviour and they will give honour to God when he judges the world. It was really nice, wasn't it, seeing uh, those scenes from Canterbury when we were uh, seeing Justin Welby just now calling us to the week of prayer. I don't know whether anyone's been to Canterbury. Uh, We got to go to Canterbury just a week or two ago for a wedding. It's absolutely beautiful. It's the back of beyond. It took about three hours to get there. You're basically at the, uh, the, the Channel Tunnel when you get there. But it's a beautiful city. And we went to a wedding. And can you believe that they actually sang, Give Me Oil in My Lamp? Um, as one of the songs, <laughs> which was hilarious. But there's that moment, isn't there, where you're sitting there and you're waiting for the bride to come in. And uh, I don't know whether you enjoy that moment. This is a, a bit of a guilty pleasure. I quite enjoy watching the groom, especially if they're a little bit cocky, sort of, <laughs> sort of sweating and looking, looking at their watch and wondering whether she's going to turn up. But it's one of those wonderful moments of anticipation, isn't it, that we have in our, in our lives. So um, we have that anticipation in the first half of 1 Peter. It's an amazing moment. And we need to look back at it because our reading today begins with a so. It begins with a therefore. And it's because it matters what came beforehand. Today we're talking about an application of Peter's um, verses that he's already spoken about. So we just need to recap um, those a few verses briefly. So I'm going to recap from verse 3 to 4. If you just have your Bibles open or your apps open, if you could move with me. From verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance. Verse 10. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. And the end of verse 12. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. So what did the angels long to look into 
What was it that they were so eager to see? What had them completely spellbound? If you just can picture the angels in heaven leaning down and waiting and watching and calling their friends to come over and to see what is going on down on earth. It's the same kind of moment when um, if you've had young children or you've got some in your family, they're about to take their first steps And if there's any other relatives there, everyone gets called in, quick, quick, they're going to do it, they're going to do it. There's anticipation, they're leaning forward, disappointment if they don't. Um, Other moments in your lives, maybe waiting for results, that sense of anticipation. Uh, Maybe you've seen your parents honoured for something in their lives, or you're going to meet someone famous, or that you're going to a concert of people that you absolutely love. We're going to see Switchfoot in a couple of weeks at Big Church Day Out, and we just can't wait. My four-year-old son can't wait. He's been saying for, I don't know how, how, how long, when are we going to see Say It Like You Mean It band? That's his favourite song that they sing. And him and my, my two-year-old stand on, the, on, on stools with their guitars rocking out, as they say, to the words. They can't wait. There's moments of anticipation for them about that. But I wonder if that moment when the angels were leaning out, I wonder if it was a little bit like this moment um, for NASA, which hopefully you've got a picture of, um, when... Neil Armstrong first set foot on the moon. And there was a moment where the, um, all of NASA are sort of leaning forward. There's a scene as, um, as they took their first steps. So if you could just hold that moment in your mind and then tear, it, tear the comparison into shreds. <clears throat> because nothing compares to the event that the angels saw and looked into. Well, what was that event? It tells us in our reading in verse 19. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold and silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes just for a moment. And just contemplate this amazing truth. And let's just let it sink into our souls. We were separated from God and all of our wrongdoing completely held us back from friendship with him. We had nothing. The angels knew that the people on earth had nothing to look forward to except judgment. But they also knew that God had promised somehow to reconcile himself to to man, to reconcile men and women to himself. But they couldn't figure out how God was going to do this. But then things started to unroll and and, and God became incarnate. And do you remember they were there with the shepherds singing when the shepherds were on the hills, singing um, in heavenly glory because they realised actually God was going to set himself on earth. But they didn't understand what could possibly be big enough to pay for our sin, not just the sin of a small group of people, but the sin of the whole world. They probably had discussions about how much gold or silver it would take to pay and realised that it couldn't couldn't, couldn't cost anything. So perhaps they talked about what, what on earth could have that much magnitude that it could pay for all of our sin. And then as things start to heat up in Jerusalem and Jesus starts to get taken towards the cross, towards his death, the penny perhaps starts to drop. And with a mixture of horror and awe, they realised that, of course, the king of the universe, the Lord himself, would put his own body, his own body on the offering table and would spill his own blood. The only commodity precious enough to do it. The only commodity precious enough to buy us back. No wonder they sing, holy, holy, holy. They just can't get over what God did. Imagine them just shaking their heads in disbelief. Can you believe what he did? Can you believe how he did it? He said he was going to do it, and he did it. He did it 2,000 years ago in history, and we are witnesses that that happened and that Christ is risen. Isn't it amazing? Do we actually really get it? Do we really understand what God did? One, one song says, he kissed the guilty world in love. Have, have we been kissed by Jesus? This is one of my favourite paintings. Um, it's called The Kiss, and it's by Klimt. And um, it's just such an evocative image. And if you can see that picture wherever you are, you can see that you have this male figure who is 
has this glorious gold gown. And I like to think of the, the black pieces in the gown as flecks of uh, symbolizing the sin that he took on. But the gold symbolizing the glory and the white symbolizing the purity of Christ. But look at the woman. And if you just remember that in the Bible, actually, the woman often symbolizes the church and um, the man symbolizes Christ. If you've got the woman, she's kind of leaning in. And at first glance, it really looks as though she's resisting him. And there may be some of that in the picture. She's kind of leaning her head back. But as you look closer, you can see that her eyes are closed and her left hand is around his hand in a very sort of um, intimate, gracious um, uh, holding of his hand there. And also her hand is flung over his neck and she's just really relishing and enjoying that moment. But I wonder whether you can identify in the picture with the holding back of the woman or whether you can identify with the, the, the leaning in and the enjoyment of it. Have you been kissed by God? Herman Hesse, um, a wonderful um, philosopher and theologian, of, uh, sort of 19th century, he said this, at the first kiss, I felt something melt inside me that hurt in an exquisite way. All my longings, all my dreams and sweet anguish, all the secrets that slept within me came awake. Everything was transformed and enchanted and made sense. Do you remember the first time you felt that kiss of Jesus? Now, my husband James says it's quite hard for blokes to imagine Jesus kissing them in a romantic way. <laughs> I can appreciate that. So how about this image um, by Charlie Maxey? And it's um, the image of the prodigal daughter or the prodigal son. So in this image, you have the father uh, with his hands. Look at those hands. It's just breathtakingly beautiful, the way that he just has the back of his son or daughter and then he has their ear, and he's just pulling, pulling them close to himself. And, and that the son or the daughter just gets lost in his embrace and can hear his heartbeat and feels so wanted and so loved. And I just hope for you that there is a moment when you knew that incomparable love of the father, that incomparable love of the lover, and that you felt that you were kissed by God. And... That is really important as we go into the other half of 1 Peter today, that we have a grasp of the love of God, the incomparable love of God, because our hearts have to be soft. Our hearts have to be soft. We need to stay hopelessly in love with God if any of the teaching about holiness is going to make sense. Our hearts really do need to be full. But... <clears throat> There is a bit more than just having soft hearts. That is so important and that's the first thing. But it's not quite enough. Does anyone know who this is? Anyone? <laughs> Mr. Jelly. Well done, Mr. Jelly. Uh, Mr. Men. Now, he gives good hugs and he is lovely and soft. But he can't really run and jump and thrive. And I have to say this, and it's, it's a hard one to say, because we love the charismatic church, don't we? We love our Pentecostal church. We love the Holy Spirit. We love new wine. But we have in the past been under a little bit of criticism from some more conservative wings of, of the church, of our family, as we were saying earlier, for perhaps having, at times, a bit of a wishy-washy Christianity or promoting a slightly wishy-washy Christianity. I remember a really chippy chaplain when I was um, a student and we had this polarisation between the very conservative Bible church and the charismatic sort of Holy Spirit church and you know I felt really torn the whole time but I remember in the very conservative church hearing um, a student pastor um, sort of lean forward and say have you heard the phrase don't wrestle Nestle. <laughs> and he was saying it to really sort of belittle that soft, squishy Christianity that doesn't promote um, developing strong bones. It's something we should be, really take seriously. There's other phrases, aren't there, that can be sometimes unhelpful. Phrases like, love God and do what you like, or it's all about grace. We can ban these phrases around sometimes as if being holy doesn't matter. And that's not true at all. 
Be holy, we're told in verse 13. Well, why should we be holy? Verse 13 says, Think clearly and exercise self-control. Prepare your mind for action. And the verse literally sort of means roll up your sleeves. Prepare your mind for action and roll up your sleeves. So we need to receive God's love, know that we're incomparably loved, but we also have some work to do. Be holy. Well, why should we be holy? I'm going to set out four good reasons. First reason, God is. God is. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. I wonder which word you, you um, identify with most um, closely. Sinner or saint? Sinner or saint? Let's just get a show of hands. Do you identify most with the word sinner? Or do you identify most with the word saint? Okay, interesting. That's about 60, 40, sinner. There is this miscomprehension that we are sinners and that we are in fellowship with Jesus who became sin for us and that we have fellowship with him in our sin. So you sometimes hear, and I mentor some people, and you sometimes hear the kinds of phrases like, well, I know it's okay because Jesus forgives me. I know it's okay to be in this place because Jesus just loves me anyway, and he's there with me. He came down to earth with us. But that's not quite right. We're not all sinners together. We are actually, like Jesus, saints. So Jesus didn't stay in his sin. It says in scripture that that death took him but death could not hold him. He rose up to life. And he, where is he now? I was just thinking about this on the way here. I was walking down from Pitfall Park. I was thinking, Jesus, you're, you're sat, you're in, you're in a position of rest. You are sat at the right hand of God in glory, clothed in white. Clothed in white. If we want fellowship with God, we can't stay in our sin, live as if we are still sinners and covered in sin. Because Jesus is clothed in white. We have fellowship with him when we remember and know that not by our own power, but because of what Christ did for us, we are saints. We are saints raised up with him. So actually the message is, be who you are. Be holy because God is holy and he has made you holy. So let's raise ourselves up by working hard, by rolling up our sleeves and acting out what is already true in heaven. I think that's a really good, important one. And I'd really recommend the Freedom in Christ course, which um, really taught me that distinction between being a saint and being a sinner, if you still feel like a sinner. So that's the first point. Why should we be holy? God is. Second point, why should we be holy? Because it matters. It matters, according to verse 17. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. He is not our little pocket God, our little soft, furry, cuddly pocket God that we get out to make us feel loved. He is the Lion of Judah. We sing that song, don't we? Um, Our God is a lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. And fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Every knee will bow before him. That's how glorious and amazing he is. I remember hearing a story about Billy Graham. And Billy Graham was travelling through Japan in a taxi, in the back of a taxi. And he looked out of the taxi and he saw a humongous poster of his own face advertising his conference. And his reaction, according to the person who was with him in the taxi, was to shrink down in his seat and cover his face and say, um, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He will have no rivals. And his reaction was one of fear. Like, I do not want to be put up on that pedestal because God has no rivals. According to one theologian, our knowledge of God as father must not dispel our dread of him as judge. Is your God a bit too cuddly, a bit too Mr. Jelly-like? 
Remember Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 2? They lied to the Holy Spirit and they lied to the church and they dropped down dead. And it says that as a result, great fear seized the church. I mean, it would, wouldn't it? (laughs) I wouldn't want to have lived in that particular era, in that particular church. That would be terrifying, wouldn't it? But do we fear God enough? Um, I think it might have been Mike Pilavachi, but I've definitely heard years and years ago, and for some reason it stayed with me, that uh, there's a helpful analogy, that God's power is like that of a mighty volcano. And in comparison, the enemy's power is like a frog's fart at the bottom of the volcano. (laughs) My son will love it that I said the word fart in the talk. (laughs) But if we don't fear God, we're going to fear someone else, aren't we? We're going to fear people or we're going to fear the enemy. And actually, we hear, I, we hear too much talk about fearing the enemy. Actually, we should fear the Lord. We should fear God. So the second point is, it matters. How do I fear and love at the same time? How do I fear and love at the same time? I think a really good analogy might be um, if you can see a very healthy relationship between children and their parents. It, we're taught in Scripture to honour our father and mother, to honour our parents. And we don't always do that, I think, particularly in our culture. But it's lovely, um, you know, I'm, I'm a parent, and it's lovely to see children honouring their parents, loving them, being intimate with them, but minding them as well. I think that's quite a helpful um, picture. Thirdly, sin destroys. Sin destroys, another reason why we should be holy. We are temporary residents and foreigners, and we're told to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your souls. Wage war against your souls. Andrew was speaking this morning on the same passage and he talked about dual nationality and the fact that the Bible says there is no place for dual nationality. Rather, we are foreigners and temporary residents here on earth. If we're not temporary residents and foreigners on earth, then that means we belong here. But our home, our residency is in heaven and it's one or the other. It's either heaven or it's here. So we have to remember that we are in a battle and that we need to be distinct. So what does it mean to be distinct? It means that um, we should be different in the way that we live. Because the desires that we have that want to be worked out literally do violence to our relationship with God. They seek to destroy us. They cause us to be distant from God. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, um, when Adam sinned, the terrible thing was that he could no longer live in relationship with God. He was outside the garden. He was hiding from God. And we can do that, can't we, when we're living a dual existence. So that's an important um, Reminder as well that sin destroys. But we do need at this point just to put out um, a little warning. We shouldn't be too bony like these famous exoskeletons. Does anyone know who that is on the left, by the way? Specifically? Lego these Gareth, no? That's Kai of Ninjago. <laughs> and the crab and the tin man. These are some famous exoskeletons. And they are... They are, bone, they are bony in the extreme. If Mr. Jelly is soft in the extreme, these guys are bony in the extreme. They wear their bones on the outside. And if this is just a warning not to become too bony. We can't become holy by willpower alone. We can't put our bones on like armour and wear it out and about. There's a story um, of a rich man that lived on a hill. And um, he had specific ways of doing things. He'd written out this great big long list and he employed a housekeeper to do everything on that list in order to keep his house wonderful, wonderfully clean and tidy. But a little bit like the scene in Love Actually with Colin Firth, one day they, they glanced at each other and love began to blossom. And him and the housekeeper, their relationship went from strength to strength. And they got married and went away on honeymoon. And when they got back, he tore up this list of things that she was expected to do as his housekeeper and threw it away. A few days later, or maybe a few weeks, depending on how observant he was, he came home early and he saw her doing all of the jobs 
that she initially did as his, as his housekeeper. And he called her over, he said, darling, darling, what are you doing? You don't have to do these things anymore. I've ripped them up. And she took out of her pocket um, the list that she'd sellotaped back together and glued beautifully. And she said, because I love you, I want to do the things that please you. Now, please forgive the sort of very extreme sort of <laughs> gender role uh, picture, but it's quite a helpful one. She knew what pleased him, and even though she didn't have to do it anymore, she wanted to do it because she knew she loved him. And isn't that true for us? We know what pleases God because scripture is full of what pleases God and what displeases him. So if we do love him, if our hearts are soft, then we will do those things that um, please him. But there's another reason as well, and that's that other people are looking on. And other people need to see our soft hearts before they see our bones. So lastly, fourthly, holiness saves others. Holiness saves others. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbours. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honourable behaviour and they will give honour to God when he judges the world. People are watching. In fact, they watch foreigners more closely than they watch residents. And they expect something different of us who claim to be Christians. They expect something better. If they see us acting just the same as everyone else, they won't believe there's any substance to our faith or that we offer anything unique. So what can we do? Here's one uh, paragraph from Hesse again. To hold our tongues when everyone is gossiping, to smile without hostility at people and institutions, to compensate for the shortage of love in the world with more love in small private matters, to be more faithful in our work, to show greater patience, to forego the cheap revenge obtainable from mockery and criticism. All these are things we can do. It's lots of small things that we can do because we are being watched. I'm part of um, an open the book team that um, go to a local school and read Bible stories. It's not a Christian school. And we are, um, we are inspiring some quite critical comments, um, looks sometimes blanked a little bit in the, in the playground. There was one conversation that was overheard just recently where a very sort of secular atheist lady was trying to drum up some, some support against the Open the Book assemblies. She'd already taken her daughter out and she wanted to see if there were any other parents that felt similarly to her. It doesn't feel nice, but it's attracting. Because we're trying to hold out the word of life, we've got to expect that that will attract criticism. And I'm just so encouraged by this verse. It says that though they accuse you of doing wrong today, they will give honour to God on judgment day. How encouraging is that? You know, do you have secular atheists around you or humanists or cynics or just people who are plain indifferent but who accuse you of doing wrong? If you do, take heart today because the, this verse encourages us to have hope and to pray for those exact same people who are the antagonists. There will be many former antagonists in heaven. Paul shows us that. If you're not attracting criticism from others, we might just want to ask ourselves, why not? Is it because we're not doing anything distinctive? Or is it because actually we don't know our neighbours? I think it's a really, you know, we're such a wonderful church. There's so many deep, wonderful friendships that it's very easy to have a love in, isn't it? Think about the last few socials that you had. Was it all Christians? Or was there a mixture of Christians and people who don't yet know Jesus? Let's be people who let our light shine before others that they may see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. I'm um, just going to end with a story, and I have told it before, so forgive me if it's a repeat, but um, this just illustrates the point beautifully. <clears throat> My uncle Keith was um, um, on national service after the Second World War, and he was um, on a boat with an RAF squadron heading out for Cyprus, and he was billeted with some other airmen, and every night one of them would kneel by his bed and would, would pray. And the other squad, people in the squadron, in the billet, would laugh at him. They would try and knock him off balance with a pillow. They'd throw bits of paper at him. But every night, he carried on faithfully. Every night, he knelt by his bed and he prayed. 
And my uncle Keith said, he laughed along. He thought it was hilarious waiting to see what someone would do that night to try to distract this guy. You can imagine his thought process. Did he think to himself, shall I become more relevant? Shall I just do this quietly so I don't offend anyone? That's the kind of thing we might consider doing, isn't it? But he didn't. He carried on. And before that boat got to Cyprus, my uncle Keith had put his faith in Jesus Christ. And through him, my mother became a Christian. And through her, me and many other members of our family. I'm so glad he stuck at it. I'm so glad he kept kneeling by his bed every night and didn't stop. If you are attracting criticism for your faith, don't stop. Love. Have that soft exterior, that soft heart. Have that fleshly look, that that overlook things. Be kind, be gracious, but have those strong bones inside growing so that we are people of substance who do what's right, who can join with the angels and sing holy, holy, holy. So there's so much to gain. Soft hearts, strong bones, we can't lose because Christ has already won.